right, so we're about to start our five hour hardcore Beatles tour in Liverpool with Eddie, our tour guide. And this is our black cab taking us Fab Four taxi tours. And our cab is called Penny Lane. So let the tour begin. That's the Empire Theatre. Okay. That's the theatre the Beatles last performed there in December 1965. Ooh. And that's why those statues are on the waterfront. Okay. To commemorate the 50th anniversary of uh, the, the last time they played Liverpool. Wow. Those statues were put there in December 2015. Up until the late 70s, this was known as 64 Mount Pleasant Registry Office. Now, a registry office was somewhere where you could go and get married if you didn't want to marry in church, you know, you needed a quick wedding. Like Las Vegas. Yep. <laughs> now, do you remember Brian Epstein, the Beatles yes, manager? Yes, of course. Here's a photograph of Brian. Yeah. Brian takes over management of John, Paul, George and Pete Best in December 1961. So Brian, in the early part of 62, is leaving his office in the city centre on a Thursday. He would go to Lime Street Station, he'd board a train, it was known as a sleeper train in the evening time, and he'd go down to London and he'd be walking the streets of London trying to get a record deal for these Beatles. One day in June, June the 6th, 62, he's successful. Now Brian would get off that train. At one time there was a famous cafeteria there that was known as the Punch and Judy. So John, Paul, George and Pete, they would always wait there for Brian. This particular, this particular day, Brian arrives at the station, he's getting off the train and he's like Lord Chamberlain in 1939 coming back from Germany with that famous piece of paper and he's waving this piece of paper at the boys so they all know now they have this record deal. <laughs> Love Me Do, that's going to be released in Great Britain on the 5th of October, 1962. So everyone's happy until August arrives. Two months before the record comes out, John tells Brian, his girlfriend, Cynthia, she's pregnant and they have to get married. Now this is a, this is a bit of a, a blow for Brian because he doesn't want any of these Beatles married at this point, especially John Lennon. He's telling John, that all the girls in the audiences look up to him. He's the leader of this band, especially here in Liverpool. And what are they going to think? You're married, a baby on the way. <laughs> no, 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 you can't do it. But all the talking in the world isn't going to change John's mind. He's adamant. According to Cynthia in her book, she said John told Brian he's doing the honourable thing. They're getting married, she's pregnant, so no more talking. Now Brian doesn't, he doesn't want this situation to happen, but he said he'll help them as much as he can. So, <clears throat> he tells them it has to be a secret this day. He's, he'll arrange everything, he'll pay for everything. So Brian applies for a license for this building on the 23rd of August, wow. 1962. John has been living with his Aunt Mimi, Mary Elizabeth. He tells her two nights before the wedding that she's actually pregnant and they're getting married. And he said she blew up like a bottle of soda, you know. <laughs> she went crazy. You're 21 years of age, John. You're throwing your life away. That girl's probably got you pregnant. You uh, just got herself pregnant. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the case. They were just two young kids in love, you know. So Mimi's angry. She's telling John she's going to boycott this wedding. She's the matriarch of this family and she's going to tell the rest of the family to boycott them. And that's what happens. Now it's upsetting for John, but it's also great for Brian. The least here, the better. Because mm -hmm. he doesn't want Beatle fans here or photographers even. Cynthia tells her mum the same night John tells Mimi. Now John and Cynthia met at our college here in the city. But Cynthia's in art students' accommodation. About a mile in that direction, mm -hmm. further south. So she tells her mum, her mum's upset because, well, she's upset for a different reason. She can't actually make the wedding. The day before the wedding, this has all been prearranged. She's going to Canada for six months and she's renting the house off. So she's upset that she can't come. So the only people involved here that day 
is John Cynthia Bryan. Paul McCartney, he's a witness to the wedding here that day. George Harrison is a guest. Now, did Sack Peep Best on the 16th of August? Ringo was introduced on the 18th. Mm. Ringo wasn't even in, invited to the wedding here. Mm -hmm. That's five days before his appearance with the Beatles. Uh -huh. To represent Cynthia's side of the family, she had a half-brother, Tony, his wife, Marjorie. They worked in the city centre here, and they got time off work for this late morning ceremony just to and Mar Mar Margie was a witness with Paul here that day. So Brian's gone for Cynthia in his car. John, Paul and George, then Marjorie and Tony arrive in the waiting room first. Cynthia arrives with John and then they're all taken into that room there on the right. That was the registry room. Now it's a simple enough ceremony. It's 15, 20 minutes. While they were inside, something had been going on outside, under the window. I'll tell you about that shortly. This was making them howl with laughter. They're killing themselves laughing inside. And when they came out of this building, the heavens decided to open because it'd been a really overcast morning. Brian foolishly told the chauffeur he could go for the day and what they have to do is run down this hill in the pouring rain. See the building with all the windows across? Yes. Behind there was Brian's, one of Brian's shops with his office there, sadly no longer there. To the left of those buildings was this place. It was a very popular restaurant in Liverpool. It was called Reese's. They did wedding receptions and by the time they get to this place, looking a little bit worse for wear weather-wise, it's a hike from here, to shown to a table. Cynthia said she even remembered the menu. It was soup of the day, it was a chicken dinner, and trifle for dessert. All paid for by Brian. And this place wasn't licensed for alcohol either. So, celebrating a wedding with tea and coffee and Coca-Cola and the likes, you know? Uh -huh. That was the wedding breakfast. The evening time arrives. John tells John and, uh, Brian tells John and Cynthia, I realize it is your wedding night, but we do have a gig to go to tonight. Now, again, across the river in an opposite direction, 25 miles from here, it's a lovely old Roman town known as Chester. Where they're heading to that night is this place, the River Park Ballroom. Sadly, no longer there, pulled down many years ago. The Beatles played here four consecutive Thursday evenings. The day of the wedding, that was a Thursday. With Jerry and the pacemakers. Yep. Mm -hmm. Now, before they leave for this place, Brian surprises John and Cynthia with a, another little gift. He realised they have nowhere to live. Her mum's renting the house off. Mimi certainly won't let them live with her. That tiny apartment you're living in, Cynthia, you can't start married life off there. This is a way of trying to control them as well. So he hands them a set of keys to an apartment which he said he seldom used and you can have that rent free. So at least they have somewhere to live. Now, I told you when they came out of this building, they're all giggling, laughing. Yeah. What had gone on under the window? Can you picture a workman on a jackhammer, digging up all the concrete, creating lots of noise. Cynthia said the window was rattling. The noise inside was horrendous. She said the registrar who was doing the wedding, she said, he was a tall, solemn looking guy and he may as well have been doing a funeral. He never cracked a smile all the way through it, you know. There was a time where he asked for the, for the groom to step forward. And just for a laugh, George stood up and he walked forward. <laughs> you know, he didn't see the funny side of anything. So when they came out the building, this guy was still drilling away, oblivious to what's been going on inside. And he thought it was really funny. <laughs> now, because of Brian, there's no photographs of that day. He insisted, you know. Um, <clears throat> John and Cynthia both met at our college in 58. She's, seven, she's 18 and John was 17. There was a 11 month age difference. Cynthia, as you know, she went on to be a really decent artist. Opened quite a few uh, exhibitions, usually down in London, you know. So what she did was she drew something from memory from that day. And this is what she came up with. So you got George, Marjorie, Tony, Paul, Cynthia, John, Brian, the registrar. There's the guy outside the window on the jacket. <laughs> she actually named this photograph, Who Takes This Pneumatic Drill? Pneumatic Drill. <laughs> Good, isn't it? <laughs> uh, 
copy of the wedding license, Paul had signed it, James Paul McCartney. Marjorie was the other witness there, tells you John was 21, Cynthia was 22 that day. He was a bachelor and she was a spinster. <laughs> Good old words. So that was their wedding day here, 23rd of August 1962. 60K. Their marriage lasted just six years. On the 23rd of August 1968, probably for a laugh, Cynthia filed for divorce on their anniversary. Yeah. Including John, she married four times. Wow. Oh. On the 1st of April 2015, she was living on the island of Mallorca off the Spanish mainland and at the age of 75, she sadly passed away of cancer. So George Washington sent an envoy here, was it? Yeah, James Maori. All right. And then Brian Epstein was born here. This was the former maternity hospital and Yoko was able to design a plaque and have it put on this building. So it tells you on the 9th of October 1940, John Lennon was born in this building, the former Liverpool maternity mm. hospital. Well, John Lennon was born here. So that was the Queen's mother. Paul moved to New York in 1971. Eventually they lived at the Dakota building where Yoko still lives I've been there, today. yeah. Yeah. There was an art exhibition there. There was, well, there was a, a museum known as the Everson Museum. And Yoko, to coincide with John's 31st birthday, she opened an art exhibition at that said museum. Mm. And that was the title of it. Oh, this is... <laughs> yeah. So, they were going to have some vacation time. Ringo didn't do much, Maureen. His wife had not long had the first child. Paul had went to France, he'd gone to Kenya on a safari holiday. George was always into that Indian culture. George mm -hmm. went to India. Mm -hmm. Now John is asked by Dick, late in that year, would he go to southern Spain with him? Now southern Spain is a place called Almeria. There's a desert there, it's the only part of Spain where there's an actual desert. Now Dick's film, filming a movie and he wants John to be part of this movie. So what they're doing is they're reenacting scenes in the Second World War. Now John must have been a good friend of Dick's to do this because John, as you know, was a pacifist. Mm -hmm. He didn't like wars. Mm -hmm. So to be photographed in his uniform with a gun as well, he must have been good friends. Mm -hmm. Well, part of John's character in that movie was to wear those little round rim glasses. So basically, that's where those glasses evolved from. The title of the movie, was how I won the war. And there's John. That's Private Gripweed. That was his name in the movie. <laughs> John Lennon's father, wow. Yeah. You can see it in the eyes a little yeah. bit. Yeah. yeah. Well, Freddie was a merchant seaman. So when John's away, uh, when he's away, John's born here. He didn't see John for a few months until he was actually born with him being away. Mm. He came back to Liverpool. Uh, Julia, John's mum, is an early one of John with his mother Julia. Julia tries to get Freddie to stay at home and don't go back to sea. He's a merchant seaman. And uh, he told that he looked around Liverpool but couldn't find work and decided he'd sign up for the ship again. So now he's bound for North Africa. She doesn't see him now till 1943 when he arrives back in port. So he does the same trick, he gets, he gets, a, he signs up for another ship, he's away again now. The, the, in between all this, the, these two are writing letters to one another and he's telling her how much he loves her, but he doesn't want to be here in Liverpool or with her all the time, you know. The letters suddenly stop, Julia's fearing the worst, she doesn't know where, what's happened to him. Um, she doesn't see him now till the end of the war. He'd actually been in prison for a while. He yeah. was dealing on the black market, you know, in mm. New York. He got caught and he's dealing in the black market. So that's why the letters stopped, you know. So, 1944, 
late 44, Julia would put John with the dad, Mr. Stanley, mm -hmm. George Stanley, known as Pop. She's living with him. The mother had died in 1934, by the way. And John's Aunt Mimi, who's the eldest of five sisters, she raised all her young sisters. So Pop Stanley was the father and Julia's living there with John. She would give John to Pop and locally, there was a place where soldiers held the dance. Cynthia, uh, sorry, Julia loved to dance. She loved to sing, she loved to party. You know, lovely long red hair. She was only five foot three, but stunning as well, you know. She gets involved with a soldier. This is a Welsh soldier. Gets a bit too much involved with this soldier because she finds herself pregnant. Mm. Now that's, that's a big no-no with Pop. Mm -hmm. You know, he's, he doesn't want Julia with this guy. Her husband's off doing his bit for the war and it's, it's, a, it's, it's a sacrilege now. Mm -hmm. She's pregnant and he's telling her she, that she can't have the baby around this neighborhood. Now, John has taken 10 miles to the side of the city. It's an area known as Maghull. It's M-A-G-H-U-L-L. -L. We pronounce it Maghull. He's gone, he's gone to stay with Uncle Sid and Auntie Madge. This is his father's brother and his wife. John, John hardly knows them, you know. He's only four years of age. Mm -hmm. Julia has taken in locally. Salvation Army had a nursing home not far from where she lived. And she, she was taken in there. She had to work for a living, you know, clean and wash the dishes and stuff. And the baby arrived on the, the 19th of June, 1945. Now it's a girl. And she christens this little girl, Victoria Elizabeth Lennon. This is a secret sister John Lennon never got to meet, mm. by the way. Oh. Yeah. Now, her father and Mimi are putting her under pressure. She can't, they tell her she can't cope with this baby. Um, John's only four. If Julia was alive today, I think she'd probably be diagnosed with bipolar. Mm. I think John Lennon had a bit of that too, mm. you know. And uh, she's put under pressure by her dad and Mimi and she has to give the baby up for adoption. Now a friend of hers, Margaret, had not long married a, a Norwegian um, <coughs> Salvation Army officer, a guy called Pedersen, his name was Peder Pedersen, and they said they would take the baby. All done legally, you know, through mm -hmm. an adoption agency. So now the baby is handed over, and the full title now she's renamed is Lillian Ingrid Maria Pedersen. She's still alive, lives in Normandy in France. Now, John had heard the story after his mother's death in 1958. Uh, his aunt Harriet and Norman told him about this story. We believe John did try to find her, but it was so difficult in those days, you know, yeah. trying to find someone, especially adopted, that he had to give up. Now, this lady never came forward till August 1998. 18 years after John's death. Now, she didn't know either, maybe. Well, she knew from a young age she was adopted, and when she was 21, she discovered her original birth certificate and her adoption papers. Her mum kept a silver tin in the bottom of her wardrobe, she said, and just being nosy, she, walked, she looked through it, and she came across these original documents, and she panicked, and she put them back and never told these adoptive parents because she's had a great life with them you know mm. so she actually waited for them both to die before she came forward so that was August 1998 now people are here in Liverpool were thinking is this some crazy lady is it she just after maybe mm. John's money or something she wasn't interested in any of John's fortune she said she just wanted the world to know he had a secret sister and it was her so a lot of movie companies film here and one of the Harry Potters was filmed here. Which Harry Potter was it? Harry Potter and the Deathly Hollows part. Two. Okay. Yeah. But the you reason put... we stop here on this tour is for that red door, number 36. Number 36. The window to the right of the door, that was Brian's apartment. Uh, Brian Epstein lives here. All right. Now this is a lovely neighborhood today and some of these houses are very expensive. They look it. When Brian rented this, 
between 1961 and 63, this was in this neighbourhood as it is today. Mm. Back in those days, this was a tough neighbourhood. Excuse me, it was a red light district also. Ah. Right up until the early 80s, yeah. Wait, Harry Potter filmed in a red light district? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This was Brian's secret CD apartment. And it was mm -hmm. also a secret Cynthia and I were living here. So what better place to write a number one song? Do you want to know a secret? Uh -huh. In this apartment. Now, when I say number one, the Beatles never released that in Great Britain as a single. Really? They did in America. Eventually it went to number two in the Billboard 100. But Brian was manager of Jerry and the Pacemakers at the time. The Beatles, another group known as Billy J. Kramer mm -hmm. and the Dakotas. Yeah. Well, John and Paul eventually wrote seven songs for him, 14 including the B-sides. So John gave that to Billy J. Kramer and he took that to number one here in, in 1963, May 1963. So that was John's, if you like, first solo number one song written in this apartment. All the, all the songwriting what was credited to Lennon and McCartney, but John had written that here. He started to write it in Germany, we believe, but he finished it here. John had this thing about when he wrote a song for someone, he always told them, there's a song I've written for you, and by the way, I wrote that while I was sitting on the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> Some of his best songwriting. Now, Mimi didn't like them living here when the baby was born, Julia. This neighborhood, she found out that Brian, by the end of 1963, planned on moving to London, all his business empire, and moving the Beatles with him. Mm -hmm. To be near Abbey Road and the film studios, it'd be better for them. So, to get them away from this secret house and this seedy neighborhood, sharing the bathroom with people upstairs, she didn't want this with a new baby, so although her and Cynthia never really hit it off, she asked them to go and live with her before they moved to London. What she did was she separated the house, she just shared the kitchen area and the bathroom. So John, Cynthia and Julian went to live with Mimi. So they lived here roughly just under a year, you know, yeah, okay. here, and then they moved to London. Okay. Now, John said he could have stolen a line, or he did steal a line, out of a very famous Disney movie in that song. When John was a young boy, Julia always sang to him at bedtime, putting him to bed. One of her favorite songs at that time was from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. It's a song called, I'm Wishing. Uh-huh. Yeah? So you see in the movie, you see Snow White hanging all the washing out on the line. She's humming away to herself. There's a, a wishing well with all the, the birds, the doves floating around it. Uh -huh. And she breaks off and she walks over to them and she puts her fingers to her lips and she goes, Shh, want to know a secret? Promise mm -hmm. not to tell. <laughs> Here we are, round this wishing well. Uh -huh. <laughs> Lion and John song. Oh, so that's where, that's where Paul with James Corden did his little concert. Yeah. Karaoke carpool. Carpool karaoke. I wish I was here that day. I know. When he was in town, by the way, I was a hundred miles away visiting relatives. Uh, My phone just kept pinging all day. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of phones were pinging that day. Some of my colleagues were very lucky to um, actually be close up to Paul that uh, day. He crack. And I can tell you, not much has changed with this place. This is like 300 years old, huh? His friends at the time was a guy called Bill Harry, mm -hmm. who started the first Maisie Beat magazine here in Liverpool. A guy called Rod Murray. He shared an apartment here with uh, a guy called Stuart Sutcliffe. Oh, yes, I'll tell Sutcliffe. you all about Stuart later. So on the wall inside is this plaque. It's called The Dissenters, and the picture of the four of them. Now, this is a group that John never ever performed with. They did this just for a laugh one drunken night here. <laughs> I'll read it out to you. Okay. Used to follow a beat poet by the name of Royston Ellis. In June 1960, 1960, these four art students attended a poetry reading by Royston Ellis 
in brackets, the paperback writer in Paul McCartney's 66 song. Ellis's work was heavily influenced by Allen Ginsberg, another American, uh, American uh, sorry, another Americans. Afterwards, the four came back here to discuss what they'd heard. They were unimpressed and decided to put Liverpool on the map, each in their own way, as the dissenters and the rest is history. Is. They did it just for a laugh, you know. <laughs> so that Cynthia said at the end of school term in this pub, after a drunken night, John and John asked Cynthia out on the first day ah. here in this pub. Mm -hmm. Cynthia was um, she had she had auburn hair. John had a fixation with blondes. At the time, his bedroom was full of posters of Bridget Bardot, you know. <laughs> and Cynthia said, "Anyone blonde, John would make a beeline for you know." <laughs> so she got fed up with all this. And one morning, she came into our college. And she's standing in the queue in the canteen there, Aww. and she'd had her hair dyed blonde. <laughs> John didn't recognise her at first. <laughs> this is Hope Street. So Paul comes to Liverpool every year. It's usually Ju uh, July. Oh, I wish you'd told me I, I come in July. And he comes here for one reason and one reason only. This is the reason, Vicky. He comes back for graduation day. Wow. Because Sir Paul has a performing arts school here, as I've just told you, known as Lipper. He, he greets all the graduates? All right, I'm going to enroll in that school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he personally hands out the, the diplomas. Okay. He's never missed this since really? 1996. Wow. Excellent. When it opened as a school. The guy in the middle, this photo, by the way, it's over 15 years old mm. now. The guy in the middle is Mark. His name is Mark Featherstone Whitty. He's the dean of the school, he's Paul's the patron of the school. He came up with an idea of a performing arts school here in, Great, in Liverpool, sorry, in the late 1980s. He loved that series, Fame, in New oh, York. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yes. Mark is talking to George Martin about this situation, and George told him, why don't you ask Paul, it's his home city. So he does, and Paul thinks it's a fantastic idea, but there was a problem, he said, Mark. Is there a building suitable? Funnily enough, Paul, you're talking 1989 now. Your old high school, where you and George went to high school, has been closed and fallen into disrepair for the last five years. So Paul, Mark, other business associates, Paul started the ball rolling with three million of his own money, we believe. He eventually had lottery funding. So 20 million pounds and six years later, the building is opened as Lipper. It was the former Liverpool uh, Institute, high school for boys. So see the building with the columns? Yes. That's the building. Oh, wow. And the building just past it is the new added on extension. Underneath it says, and School of Art, 1825. Now see that plaque between the second and third window yes. above that white truck uh -huh. there? That tells you in the 1830s, Charles Dickens used to give readings in that school. Really? Wow. Paul passed a scholarship at the age of 11, like we all had to sit back in those days. It was known as the 11 plus. If you passed it, you more or less chose the school of your choice. If you didn't, like me, you stayed in the school that you were already in. Uh. So Paul passed and he chose the Liverpool Institute High School for Boys, as it was known then. The following year, in 54, George Harrison is 11, he passed his scholarship and he chose the same school. Now, 12 miles outside the city, where they were both living, three roads away from one another, but waited for the bus, the school bus at separate bus stops, only about 200 yards away from one another, they would board the same bus, go to school on the same bus, went to school, but never knew one another in those early days. Now, Paul had 700 and something students, he said. His goal was to have 2,000, so he needs bigger premises. But he didn't really want to move. See this building here? This was leased out to the university up till about three years ago. When the lease ran out, there was lots of interest in it. Some guy was hoping to buy it and make it into a boutique hotel. But Paul and his business partners, they stepped in and they bought the building. So now he has his wish. 
I, I just noticed that this is not junk. This is like a statue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you. For a sculpture. <laughs> but this building was also sentimental to Paul. This was the former College of Art and Design. So in this college here, you had John, Cynthia, Stuart Sutcliffe. Right next door at high school were George and Paul. Wow. And in the beginning, nobody knew one another. <laughs> and the right next door. To really? Wow, that's interesting. Down the side street here, on Polk Street, was the main entrance of this building. It's no longer the main entrance. A photograph of John and Cynthia was taken in the spring, in the, sorry, in the, yeah, in the spring 1959. They're sitting on the roof of a little car right outside that main entrance. She's 19 and John is 18 in that photograph. That's my favorite photo, Vicky. Pretty lady, wasn't she? I saw her in person once at a Beatles convention. Yeah. Dear Mrs. Sutcliffe, thank you for your letter. Your son did not attend for the x-ray which I arranged, but I do not think this matters very much because the x-ray which he had in Germany was within the limits of normal. And my impression was that most of his symptoms were at nervous origin. Yeah, I guess he was wrong about that. Yeah. And 25. So John failed. He failed. Cynthia, Cynthia passed. And it shows you that. Stuart, he also passed. Okay. But even though he failed, I think John did okay later on. Oh, I think so. This is the steps here. There's John with Cynthia sitting right on these steps. And here's this pillar here. Look. This, this was a tough neighborhood when I was a teenager. <laughs> it was, um, my dad knew I was walking around here. He had to give me a, a clout across the ear all, you know. Um, he, he didn't realise though when I was 15, that's 1966. Across the road where it's all changed now, there used to be tenements there, you know. So that's, that's the way the neighbourhood was. It's not like that now, it's totally the opposite. But Rosebury Street here, on the 22nd of June, 1957, we're having a street party, along with all the other streets in Liverpool. Liverpool was celebrating as a city, 870, 800, sorry, 750 years old. So all the streets were having a street party. But John's first band was called the Quarrymen. He formed that at grammar school. It was called Quarry Bank Grammar School. And uh, <clears throat> the Quarrymen were John, Rod Davis, Colin Hanson, Len Gary, and Pete Shotton. John's best friend on washboard. The drummer, Colin, had a friend, Charlie Roberts, who's still alive by the way, lived in this street. Now his mother, Mrs. Roberts, is organizing the street party here. So she's asking Charlie to ask Colin, the drummer, who Charlie had stenciled his name on his drum kit by the way, Colin Hanton, the quarryman. He's asking Colin, would he ask John Lennon a favour and be the entertainment here for the street party. Well, John jumped at the chance. You, you're kidding. Performing in front of people? Too right. So the quarrymen now all came from a village about three or four miles further south, known as Walton. It's classed as a bit of a, you know, middle class area. So, so to all the kids here, these were posh kids, you know, coming to this neighbourhood. One of the neighbours had a flatbed truck so that was their stage, so they're higher than anybody else. That day here, these are the very first photographs of John Lennon ever being taken, performing as the quarryman in this street. That's how the street used to look. So can you picture this street looking like that? It was just a row of terraced houses, oh, wow. you know. And one more photo, oh, yeah. close up of them there. So these are the very first photographs of John ever taken performing anywhere in Liverpool <laughs> as the quarryman. Two weeks later to the day, on the 6th of July 1957, 
that's when John Lennon was introduced to Paul McCartney mm. and I'll tell you all about that later. So all these kids who are streetwise, tough, all these posh kids from the further south, John's on stage performing, no glasses, these kids are thinking he's pulling faces at them. Oh. <laughs> so word got around that these kids were saying, I thought that guy's taking the mickey out of us, you know. So they're going to, the, 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 the rule of thumb was at the end of the performance, they were going to jump John Lennon. So Pete Shotton had heard this while he's playing his washboard and he walked around the platform and he's whispering in their ears and telling them what's gone on. So at the end, John said, at the end, the very last song, we pull the plugs on the amps and we run into Mrs. Roberts. So that's what happened. So all these kids now are hammering on the door and the windows, trying to climb over the wall just at the back, just to get at these kids, you know. So the police were involved. And the police marched John and the quarryman up to this bus stop and waited with them until they got the bus. And the other crowd of kids are here hoping that the police will leave, you know. But the bus came and John and the quarrymen got on the bus. On the bus with a, a drum kit, a TTS bass, you know. So uh, what does John do? He runs straight to the back of the bus, not a big window on the back, and he's pulling faces out the front and gesticulating <laughs> to them, you know. <laughs> ah, he was a troublemaker, huh? <laughs> but they got away with it that day. Yeah. The people who are building these houses, uh, re renovating these houses, have told us that once Ringo's has been completed, it, nobody's going to live in this house. They said it's going to be unfair on anybody they put it, put in this house, you know? They went so it's, it's, right. it's just going to be left vacant. Mm. Uh, but that's for Beatle fans to still come take photographs. Yes. So imagine a family being in there and Beatle fans coming every day. Absolutely. From this house, count five windows down. Okay. And that was Ringo's house. Yeah. That's where he was born. In the bedroom of that house, while there was an air raid going on, by the way. Really? 7th of July, 1940. Now Richard's own parents lived at number 59 on the end block. Elsie and Richard married in 1938. And they came to rent here at number nine. He was a, a baker during the war. That's where she met him. He was a lucky guy because that was a job that was needed here. So he didn't have to go and join up and fight for, for the war effort, you know? It's alleged he was a bit of a ladies' man, a bit of a heavy drinker, and you know he could get stuff on the black market, sugar, flour, eggs, milk, wow. and he'd bake away here. And again, it's alleged that when housewives who were struggling feed, trying to feed the kids, come knocking on his door for maybe a loaf, a few eggs or something, he would never accept payments in cash. <laughs> Elsie turned the blind eye to all this in the beginning. One day in 1943, she'd had enough of him and told him to pack his bags and clear off. So he did, but he didn't go far. He went to his own parents' house there. <laughs> so Elsie now is not getting any financial support off him. She's got two part-time jobs. She's a cleaner of a day. She's a part-time barmaid of an evening. So these houses, when they were built in the late 1880s, they're known as the Welsh Streets. They've got, they're named after places in North Wales. People from North Wales came to live here in the late 1880s and built these houses. And they came to work on the docks here, you know? When they were built, they were built with, these were three bedrooms, no bathroom, and the toilet was in the yard. It was just like a lean-to in the yard, little tiny shed. It wasn't until the mid 60s that the government built an extension on the back of every home so everyone could have a nice indoor toilet and bathroom. Mm -hmm. The rent was too expensive here for, for Elsie. Uh -huh. So round the corner, she's in a pub called the Empress. There's a guy in the pub called Mr. Patterson who's living in a tiny side street next to the pub. He's in a two bedroom house and he's got a wife and three girls. So you can imagine how cramped that is. Yes. What people used to do all those years ago if they wanted to, they would 
go to the city council, explain the city situation, mm. and more often than not, the city council will allow you to exchange houses. Mm. So, Elsie and little Richard move out of this house. He's three years of age, and they move into a house around the corner, number 10, Admiral Grove. That's where all his memories are from the age of three till he was 23 when he left Liverpool. Ringo's come out with many a statement and said, I don't know what all the fuss is about this house <laughs> because I have no memories of that house. Right. So this was part of the album cover for Sentinel Journey. This used to be a grocery store and Ringo was right there. And there it is, the cover of Sentimental Journey. This building appeared on the sleeve of Ringo Starr's first solo album, Sentimental Journey. Ready? L8, there we go. Right. So earlier on I told you Brian had planned to move the Beatles to London by the end of 1963. So Ringo was photographed, possibly for the last time, walking along here. That's the 7th of December, 1963. Uh. <laughs> now, Ringo moved his parents out in 1964. That's around the time the government were building this extension on the back of every home. So Margaret then lived at number 12, two doors away. So Margaret now has moved to an end property till her house was being renovated. And when it was renovated, there was a mix-up with the paperwork in the city office, and she said they'd given their house to another family by oh, mistake. Really? But number 10 was ready and empty to move into. So with known Ringo, his mum and stepdad, she decided to live here. So Margaret eventually had this house painted pink and white for a reason. It's the colour of the lady's breast cancer. Mm. So her way of raising money for breast cancer, uh -huh. if she felt like it, she would invite Beatle fans in. Uh -huh. And she'd say to you, look, now I, I only knew Ringo, didn't know John, Paul or George, so all this memorabilia on my walls is Ringo. Mm -hmm. So if you want to take photographs of it, put a donation in a tin and mm -hmm. sign this little register she had. That was her way of raising money. I'll show you how Margaret looked. She has Ringo all over. Yeah, all over the walls. That was her way of raising money for breast <laughs> cancer. Now see above the door, you've got the V sign. People used to put that after the war, V for victory. Yes. There's Ringo's mum, Elsie, cleaning the front door. There's the V above the door there. And this was his stepdad, Harry Graves. Although it wasn't his biological father, Ringo said that was his real father. It was Harry who bought Ringo's first half set of drums here when he was a teenager. So he had tuberculosis and he had his appendix burst and he was, they gave him last rites. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. He, was, that was, he was seven when, he, when that happened. On his, yeah, seven. Wow. Yeah. And where Ringo went to was quite a hike for his mum. It was across the river, an area known as Heswell. It's not there now. So it would have been a bus journey, a uh, ferry across the Mersey, and two more buses to get to where she was going. And in all, uh, and you, you could be in a, you could be in a hospital for anything from three to six months. You know, wow. just you just depended how quick you recovered. Mm. In this park, it's where John Lennon's mother Julia and Freddie actually met. Yeah. The other side of the park, over behind us, there is the Bolton Lake. There's a picnic area. Where Julia and Freddie Lennon first met when they were 14 and 16 years of age. Now, Penny Lane, Paul Rudolph wrote that song in response to John, writing Strawberry Fields Forever. When John was in Spain filming How I Won the War, that's where he wrote that song. Now, Paul asked John what the song was about. John's telling Paul all he's doing in this song, Paul, is rekindling his childhood memories. Strawberry Field, if he didn't already know, was a children's orphanage. And it was a big Gothic-style Victorian house behind where Mimi lived. John could see it from Mimi's 
his house, you know. Now these two, John and Paul, always had a little bit of friendly rivalry, like who could write the best song. Paul went away and he came up with Penny Lane. Penny Lane is all about Paul's childhood memories. Where we're going to stop is where Paul stopped during the carpool karaoke. He gets his pen out and he signed, which was, or still is, the only original sign that's actually left there in Penny Lane. Now we're going to turn into it now, but the signs that you see on either corner here, they're not original. These have been stolen that many times over the years. People can't remember how many. And the only way around the thieving, by the way, yeah. was to paint them on the wall. <laughs> so this is the only survivor here. Right here, okay. Right on the wall here. Find it. <laughs> Paul McCartney. So they framed it after he signed it? There's that many people here, Andy, Vicky, after Paul came to sign this. I've never known Penny Lane so busy in my life. <laughs> so under a bit of pressure from some of the guides, the city council came and put this on. Now it's okay in the shade here, right. but when the sun's at its highest, you can't it see forms it. a glare on yeah. it. It's, it's, it's but, a bit of a nightmare. But I see a lot of well. signatures on the wall here. Yeah, yeah. Never reached number one here in Great Britain. Remember a guy called Inglebert Humperdinck? Yes. Mm -hmm. Someone called Please Release Me, a ballad. Yes. He kept the Beatles off the top of the charts in 1967. He was number one here for weeks and weeks and weeks. So Strawberry, Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane were not on any album, is that correct? No. So they were just singles. Paul eventually went to number one with Penny Lane all over the world. Now you've seen the Red Album with the 27 singles on Right. It's on that. But Strawberry Field right. is not but on But originally it. it was not. No. But like you said, it, George Martin wanted to put on Sgt. Pepper. Yeah. He, second, he regrets about not putting on Sgt. Yeah. Pepper. Well, it's funny, we, we went to Abbey Road in um, London, and as we were walking to Abbey Road, uh, Giles Martin, George Martin's son, walked by us. Did he? Yeah. Well, for the 50th edition, Giles put those two songs oh, on put? the 50th edition. Okay. Yeah. Well, the 50th anniversary that album. Giles' his son, he put those two tracks yeah. on that. Was that. That was his dad's biggest regret, he said. <laughs> so that's the barber, Bialetti. Bialetti. The gentleman's hairdresser. So he's the barber showing photographs. The shelter in the middle of a roundabout is that flat roof building. Hmm. This was a ticket office. These were your public bathrooms. And here you would go and sit inside and wait for the next bus or tram to come along. On the corner here he sings. There is a banker with a motor car. The little children laugh at him behind his back. Today it's a doctor's surgery. It used to be a what we call a Midland bank, which became a Barclays bank. The barber shop is just here. So we'll drive up Penny Lane, cross this junction. We usually do, but I'm taking you somewhere else. So we'll come this way, past the shelter, turn this corner, hopefully park here if we can. What Paul's writing and singing about is the neighborhood of Penny Lane. Mm. The fireman with the clean machine, that was the fire department. Paul and George would pass this every day to and from school. Always something going on here. Now, this fireplace, this fire station so, uh, sorry, actually closed the same day as Cynthia Lennon died, coincidentally. Mm. Wow. The 1st of April 2015. The young lady in white was a girl called Elizabeth Davidson. In this neighbourhood here, you have a primary school, which John Lennon attended. Dovedale Primary School, and so did Beth. When Beth left school, she's training to be a nurse. So every November, this part of the world, we sell these Remembrance Day poppies on. You wear them on your lapel for all the fallen soldiers throughout the wars. Well, Beth would near it wear a nurse's cadet uniform. She'd put a tray of poppies round her shoulders. She'd go and stand behind that busy shelter at the top there. So in the song, she is the pretty nurse selling poppies from the train. Then Paul sings, she feels she's in a play. 
she is anyway. Mm. Beth really wanted to be an actress. That's why she's in that white costume there. <laughs> her, her dad built her a stage in the backyard. She used to put plays on for all the young kids in the, in the area. Well, she married John's best friend. John's best friend was a guy called Pete Shotton in the Quarrymen. And John had gone right through school with him from the age of five. So they became great friends. And he's the washboard player in the Quarrymen. Beth sadly died young, she was 34, and she died of cancer. Pete eventually remarried, he went to live in America for many years. He settled in a little town not far from here called Nutsford. And in March 2017, at the age of 76, he sadly passed away of a heart attack. So what Paul is writing and singing about is this just this neighborhood here of Liverpool, all his childhood memories. And the, the road Penny Lane is named after uh, a 7th and 18th century slave trader by the name of James Penny. Ah. He was a merchant also and he, the big building ahead of us on the right which is now a pub and a restaurant this was part of the mansion house that he lived in and it's called Duffdale Towers. You see it's no longer a flat roof building. Right. The guy bought the building off the city council. He put that extension on the top and it's still under construction at the moment. He's making it into a bistro as you can see. Sergeant Pepper Bistro. Sergeant Pepper Bistro, okay. So in the carpool karaoke, I remember Paul was talking about this church. Yeah, he points and he He's, said that's where me and our Mike used to sing in the choir and Mike got married there. Penny Lane. So Penny Lane is going which way? That's Penny Lane. Oh, yeah, okay, so it's that's, that's the end of it. Right. This, we're no longer in Penny Lane, okay. but it's, what he's singing about is the Penny Lane neighborhood, you know? Right. This is the barber shop in the Penny Lane song. How oh, the original shop interior used to look. And the guy right on the end with his arms folded is Mr. Bialetti. Okay. And if you look over there, there Paul, that's Paul in the shop here when he came now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now the lady Adele who owns it, she does something like Margaret did back at the house. You look on the wall here. It's got letters for, for cancer, uh, the cancer appeal. Well, we were going to go inside the Penny Lane Barber Shop, but it's closed for lunch. But here's a look inside a little bit. If you want to go inside, you make a little donation, it goes to charity. And there's some pictures I can't see what they are. The Beatles are in here somewhere. And this is where Paul McCartney came with James Corden to the Carpool Karaoke. Very cool. 